Today we have our first session in a series of uh, planned sessions discussing various sections of data privacy law, comparing relevant laws. Uh, this is uh, an idea mooted by Mr. Ramesh Venkatraman. Um, today we would be dis discussing the data controller obligations of uh, GDPR, CCPA, and DPA. Along with Mr. Ramesh Venkatraman, we have uh, two more uh, veteran professions, uh, professionals in this field, Mr. Anil Chiplunka, uh, founder of Info Counselors, and Mr. Srinivasan Tirumurthy, uh, data privacy advisor of Siemens Limited Bank Lord. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ramesh. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Manju. And uh, as she said, I also would like to start the uh, session by really thanking Mr. Navi uh, for really spearheading, you know, and mentoring all of us on this without, you know, looking at any kind of, if I can say so, <laughs> any benefit per se. You know, I always uh, uh, pull him saying that uh, yeah, not only FDPPI section, eight company, even Mr. Navi. You know, thank you very much, Mr. Navi. Having said that, let's continue. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. sir. Uh, let us continue. Now, the it's going to be like this. Uh, uh, it will, we will start with Mr. Srini. Um, he's also our one of our supporting member uh, from the uh, FDPPA perspective, very closely working with all of us. And uh, he will talk about only one topic per se, data controller from the uh, India uh, Data Protection Bill perspective, what they are addressing as a data controller. The same data controller, how the CCPA views it, would be handled by Mr. Anil. And finally, the same data controller is how it is handled, the expectations, et cetera, from the GDPR perspective. So we thought that giving this kind of, you know, it will be creating some kind of, you know, good interest amongst all of us. And we will take probably 10 to 12 minutes, each one of us to put our thoughts, what we really wanted to convey. And after that, let us have a kind of good discussion amongst us absolutely feel free that any of the important bullets, if we should have missed it from any one of the law perspective, feel free to take that and then let us have a kind of good discussion because it's not a training session. Okay, number one. Number two, as we all know, obviously we cannot just talk about in 10 minutes, but we're trying to give you that capsule to generate the interest and kind of you know discussion point. Thank you very much. Having said that, I would request to Srini to start with and Srini, please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, greetings, uh, good evening to everyone, and namaskar to Navi sir on account of Guru Purnima Day. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the data fiduciary obligations from the Indian Data Protection Bill, which was presented in the parliament in December 16, 2021. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, data fiduciary is defined under section three, uh, three clause 15 uh, from the data protection bill 2021. The definition goes like this, uh, any natural person or a legal person, including state or a company or a non-governmental organization who alone or jointly in conjunction with determines the purpose of and the means of processing a personal data. Basically, a data fiduciary shall determine the purpose and the means of processing a personal data. Next one. So basically, he will be the first point of contact for a data principal. He will determine the purpose which should be lawful, legal, um, and the, you, should, you should basically have a contract with the data subject. Employment purpose is also one of the lawful purpose under which a data can be collected and processed. It should be under the legitimate interest of the organization of, the, of where the data fiduciary pertains to. And legitimate interest shall not cause any harm to the data subject. And it can also be for any other legal obligations as uh, appropriate. Fiduciary. So every data, uh, uh, all other data law, data protection laws, uh, which is existing, uh, they have, they are using the word data controller. Uh, Indian data uh, law is quite unique. They are using the word fiduciary. So what is the definition of fiduciary from the legal point of view? Fiduciary is a person in a position of trust. So your fiduciary duty is a legal obligation of one party to act in the best interest of another. 
a trustee is an obvious example of a person in a position of trust even the executive directors who are appointed as per the indian company law they also hold the fiduciary duties so these duties are coming from the general law perspective so we will see what are the fiduciary duties that a trustee owe to the beneficiary of a trust basically they should act in a good faith in the interest of beneficiary so we can link a uh, data fiduciary should act in the interest of a data principal to act in accordance with a trust deed it could be a partnership deed it could be a trust deed it could be any chartered document it could be a articles of association it could be a memorandum of association as well not to make a profit from their position not to make a profit including any secret profit from their position okay not to place themselves in a position where their own interest conflict with their fiduciary duties so a data fiduciary shall take decision in the best interest of data principal and not based on their own interest that is very important not to take their not to take not to act to their own advantage or the benefit of a third person without the beneficiary's informed consent so very important here is informed consent is also an explicit consent as per the bill so they should not act to their own advantage or the benefit of the third person so whatever the purpose for which the consent is provided they should use only for the same purpose to properly invest the trust property so whatever the data which is collected process should be in line with the data production requirement as per the legitimate purpose of the organization for the lawful business purpose us very very important point the last point not not the least one to exercise reasonable care skill and diligence even section 43 capital a of it act mentions any sensitive data which is being processed we should ensure yeah, due diligence and reasonable security practices being implemented so a data fiduciary shall take care of all this even without any legal obligation these these duties come stream by virtue of the word fiduciary types of data fiduciary or classes of data fiduciary in indian law we have a significant data fiduciary uh, under section 26 it is it will be determined by the we have to wait for more guidelines for the threshold limit from the data production authorities by the volume of the you know personal data being processed the risk of harm which can be caused to the data principles sensitivity of the personal data being processed turnover of the data fiduciary social media platform or any other new technologies which is being involved so basically once the law comes into face a, a data fiduciary should be registered as a significant data fiduciary with the data protection authorities depending on the threshold limits which is being determined by them concern manager under section 311 very very important which is which is a very unique aspect from the indian data protection law mr navi sir used to say in many training forums this is a big job opportunities as a concern manager once this bill uh, takes a shape of an act so data fiduciary basically they can enable they can appoint a person as a concern manager who can give or withdraw or review or manage the consent of the data principal through any accessible or a transparent or any interoperable platforms guardian data fiduciary was there in the previous bill 2019 bill it was dropped in the 2021 amendment uh, but still i thought i can i want to bring this to the attention of this audience so under section 16 whenever the children data is processed a children data is such data of a child is was not attained the age of 18 as per the current bill they have to verify the age of the child they should have a mechanism data fiduciary and they should obtain the consent of the of their parent or guardian okay that is also very very important and they are barred from profiling or behavioral or monitoring or targeting any advertising at the expense of the child information so that is not allowed and uh, any anything which is processing can cause any significant harm is also not allowed what is significant harm is also defined under section 3 uh, yeah, any harm which is a uh, impact of that is very very severe where it is irreparable the irreversible the harm can be irreversible that is significant harm the obligations of data fiduciary under indian data protection bill section 5 says purpose limitation yes whatever the purpose for which the data principal is consented we shall be using it for the same purpose we cannot use it for a different purpose of course the purpose shall be legal lawful and in the legitimate interest of the organization notice 
very important is section 7 says we have there is a requirement of notice before the commencement of processing a data fiduciary shall uh, give a notice to to the data principal for what is the purpose for which that you know personal data is collected or oh, for what is the what is the category of data which is being processed uh, contact details of data fiduciary how the data is being stored within the organization what are the technical and organization safeguards we are we are having will there be any cross border transfer of data cloud storage facility in different countries all that and to whom this data will be shared you know all that has to be properly mentioned as per the section 7 quality of the personal data uh, yeah data fiduciary should be responsible to maintain the accuracy of the data of data principal so you should ensure that on a periodic basis you should review the data and you should update the data in a timely manner storage limitation so the bill says uh, data shall be deleted if the purpose is achieved if the objective is achieved, then we should delete the data immediately, unless we have any other legal obligation. For example, Companies Act can say we have to store the data for eight years. Income Tax Act can say we have to store the data up to seven years. So is there any, any other legal obligation is there? We have to take care of those aspects. We basically, we should refer for any deletion or retention policies within the organization. Accountability, of course, the word fiduciary itself you know, uh, uh, mentions the word accountability. You should be responsible to demonstrate compliance with respect to Indian law. So it could be a uh, you know, privacy impact assessment you know, or performing the harm audit or performing the compliance audit. All that will fall within the scope of accountability. Consent. It is explicit consent. What it means, it should be a free consent. It should be an informed consent. It should be consent that should be as per the section 14 of Indian Contract Act, where the consent should not be obtained by, by means of coercion or force. It should be a voluntary consent. It should be very specific. It should be very clear. It should be capable of being withdrawn, revocable consent. All this activity, all these clauses should will fulfill the explicit consent. Other obligations for a data fiduciary or a significant data fiduciary, section 20, 22 mentions about the privacy of privacy by design policy. Of course, GDPR also talks about this privacy by design. Here it is slightly different. A data fiduciary, every data fiduciary shall obtain a privacy by design policy and it it will be uh, it will be approved by the data protection authorities it has to be published in the website as well of course what is privacy by design it's a proactive approach where uh, that organizational practices or a technical system shall anticipate or identify any harm which can be caused to a data principle so an harm audit has to be performed as per the section 22 by the data fiduciary at a project planning stage when, when, the, when the contract is being negotiated. At the initial stage only, these aspects have to be conceived. Section 23 also talks about maintaining transparency in the processing of personal data. For example, even a fairness to algorithm, okay, has to be mentioned in the privacy notice. In case we are developing any app, any tools, which is processing any personal data, that has to be taken care as per the section 23. Section 24 talks about security safeguards. Any data which is collected has to be secured as per the information security standards of the organization. Uh, they have to assess the risk from the severity and the likelihood. Of course, uh, technical and organizational safeguards has to be taken care. Encryption control, admission control, access control, system access control, uh, input controls, all that and confidentiality and integrity and availability of the personal data has to be taken care. Section 27 also enables a significant data fiduciary shall perform a data protection impact assessment. This has to be done by in consent and with approval of the DPO, data protection officer. So any, any new technology is being involved, any, any uh, a large amount of data is being involved, sensitive personal data is being involved, then this assessment has to be, pro has to be performed by the fiduciary in, in consent with the data protection officer. And whenever data protection authorities are asking for any kind of a report, they, sh they should be able to share how the processing is being performed, what kind of measures they have uh, uh, taken care to protect the personal data. Section 29 is a very unique section. Uh, um, every significant data fiduciary shall audit the policies and processing by an independent appoint, uh, auditor, which is you know, as per the section 29. So independent auditor will be determined by the data production authorities. And as such, they will be auditing the organization uh, and they will be publishing the data trust score, which is quite unique as per the Indian law perspective. 
Section 30, of course, every significant data fiduciary, it, it, the, the, they are using the word shall. Shall is mandatory appointment of DPO. So for a normal data fiduciary, it is may, it is optional. So for every significant data fiduciary, they have to appoint a DPO. A DPO will be a, a CEO or a CFO or a company secretary. He will be a key manager per, per personnel who shall be appointed by virtue of a board resolution, basically. And he will be a permanent employee of the organization, unlike in GDPR, where even a third party can also act as a DPO, as a consultant that is not there in the Indian law. Section 32, of course, uh, mentions about procedure and effective mechanism to redress any grievance of data principles in a timely manner, in an efficient manner. 33 also talks about the data localization aspects where any sensitive data is involved. We have to, uh, it cannot be, it has to be a copy of the data has to be stored within India. Explicit consent has to be obtained. Mm -hmm. um, data production, sorry. Data production authorities shall, um, shall approve the, as per the, like, like how we have BCR as per GDPR, there is also an intra-group scheme which, is, which has to be approved. And all these aspects has to be taken care. Critical personal data, most of you are aware, shall not be processed outside India. And it is not defined as such by the Indian law. Uh, we have to wait for the uh, guidelines. Obligation towards audit, uh, a data fiduciary shall perform a harm audit. At what stage? At the privacy by design stage, at the initial stage, at a project planning stage. And whenever the, any transfer of data is happening outside India, at that stage, you will, you will also assess the harm which can cause to data principle. Uh, and uh, any new technology is being involved, any sensitive personal data is being involved, then data protection impact assessment has to be done in consent with the, in approval with the data protection authority. Of course, security safeguards. What are the technical and organizational safeguards? Yeah, it has to be implemented. And there also he has to do a likelihood and severity of the harm which can be caused in the data processing. Complaints audit, we saw section 29. Uh, it has to be done by independent auditor. The audit has to happen on an annual basis and data trust score has to be published uh, in the privacy notice and also in the websites of the data fiduciary. Data processor audit. If the data processing, if the data uh, significant uh, fiduciary is outsourcing any activity to a data processor, in such cases, he should also audit the uh, data processor to ensure the they are, they have also implemented proper protection uh, for the processing of personal data. Child data audit. Uh, whenever the child data is uh, being uh, collected and processed before processing, they have to assess the harm, any any risk can be caused to the child uh, out of that. So that, that audit is also mandated from the section 16 perspective. So these are the various audit which is responsible for the data fiduciary from the Indian perspective. Uh, thank you so much. Over to Mr. Anil. Great. Thank you very much, Srini. Anil, sir? Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you, Srini. And thank you, Ramesh, for setting the tone of our discussion today. And uh, I will also start with uh, giving gratitude to all our uh, gurus here, including Navi sir and all the senior members who have trained us and shared the knowledge throughout these sessions as well as through our training program. So today what uh, we are trying to look at is the CCPA, essentially the California Consumer Privacy Act. And what I tried to do is I just tried to pick up a few pointers to uh, show what kind of applicability this act has and what are the uh, obligations. And here we will not talk about data control per se, but we'll talk about business and that will uh, look into this. For this, I have also referred to whatever Ramesh sir has uh, taught us during our CDPP training programs. Uh, so it was a wonderful to revisit and pick up a uh, few of the pointers from there. Uh, it's, it's a real refresher kind of thing. And as Ramesh mentioned, it is not uh, really a training program, but it's more to give a pointers to few of the things which will generate interest in professionals to probably look at uh, more such aspects and more detail into this. And uh, maybe few of our guys, uh, a few of our friends can be attracted towards uh, completing a complete CDPP program uh, going through this. So let's come to CCPA. The CCPA, as it says, it applies to the businesses worldwide maintaining personal information typically on California residents. So here it talks about the consumers and it does not really refer to as them as a data subject or data principle, 
but they are typically the consumers, essentially the California residents. Now, which businesses come under CCP? There are three uh, criteria. So any one or more of these criteria, if the business is fulfilling, then the CCPA becomes applicable to them. When the gross revenue of the business uh, is more than $25 million, and I'm going to just look at these uh, three pointers in next uh, couple of slides, then 50,000 consumers or devices, if they are processing data about this, and this becomes really interesting when they talk about devices, because devices practically can include anything related to your laptop, your Wi-Fi router, your uh, mobile phones or IoT devices, there are so many things. So that becomes really tricky for the organization who are looking at this. And if a revenue uh, generated out of selling or sharing the personal information is more than 50%, then California uh, Consumer Privacy Act becomes applicable to that business. So let me go to the next step. Yeah. So as we're talking about the gross revenue, is more than 25 million. So typically here, uh, interesting thing again is, it says by entities who are controlling that business or they are jointly in a common control uh, with, with the business. So if there are multiple uh, entities, uh, like we have data processor and sub processor and all those kind of things, but if they are jointly doing it and the business uh, revenue is more than 25 million, then they come under CCPA, right? And as it says, this aggregated revenue number across all these entities is not only a single entity, but if the business is running multiple, then definitely there are multiple entities uh, which will be counted for these revenues. Let's go to this. And this I was mentioning a tricky part because if you look at this, 50,000 Californian consumers is a fairly okay to estimate and uh, really look at it. But when we talk about personal information that includes MAC addresses, internet browsing histories like cookies, the geolocation data and devices or households, then it becomes real tricky uh, for the business. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about this uh, mainly by my understanding of the CCPA. And as I said, uh, referring to what Ramesh uh, taught us during our programs, as well as referring to the attorney general site of CCPA, because I, to be honest, till date, I have not really come across the practical implementation experience of CCPA. So it's more of a theory. So if we have got uh, our friends here who have actually implemented it, we'll love to get the uh, experience sharing from them also. Now, when we talk about the 50% revenue, so revenue from selling that data or sharing that data, uh, where half of the revenue obtained from this data is uh, towards this, the gross revenue, 50% of the revenue is obtained because of selling of this personal data, then that particular business comes under CCPA obligation. As we're talking about uh, data controller is not the term uh, used by CCPA, it uses term as business, and business it defines as an entity, we determine the purpose and means of processing the personal information. So as uh, Srini also was mentioning about the purpose, the lawful purpose. So here, typically the business house, the organization, which determines how they are going to collect the data, how they are going to process the data, that will be termed as business under CCPA. So equivalent mapping to uh, data fiduciary or data controller uh, terminology person. So let's look at the next slide. And as I said, I have not really gone into uh, more detailing like uh, Srini did having sections and everything because I wanted to just keep it as a discussion pointer. And to be honest, not being a lawyer, uh, I'm a little uh, afraid of looking at section numbers <laughs> because it, it becomes real uh, complex uh, for me at, at some point in time. Just give me a second. <clears throat> so while discussing, we can also look at similarity between these uh, different acts. So if we look at the first obligation for uh, the business is to provide the privacy notice. And similarly, we have seen in uh, when Srini was discussing about privacy notice. So this notice again, similar to our DPA include what kind of data they are going to collect, how they are going to process it. And this notice has to be issued, <clears throat> could be as part of privacy policy of the organization. Also at the data collection point to the consumers, that is what the CCPA says. So, when the business is looking at uh, 
the collecting points or pointers where the data is being collected from consumers they have to ensure that the consumers are made aware via the privacy notice then purpose limitation it's uh, similar to uh, what we discussed earlier companies or the businesses have a obligation to use that data only for the purpose for which they have collected so they have declared in their privacy notice that this is how they are going to use that personal data so they are supposed to use only to that extent now when we are looking at these obligations uh, typically we have obligations towards the consumers here as well as obligations towards uh, uh, the government where the compliance has to be met then we look at some interesting stuff here which it says provide do not sell option because when we look at ccpa applicability there are uh, uh, descriptions where organization can sell the data because the 50% of revenue by selling of data that is one of the criteria so if an a uh, particular consumer does not want the organization to sell their data then organization must provide a do not sell option for the consumer to access their rights and this is uh, more or less related again to the non discrimination which is uh, second from below, below wherein if a person is selected a do not sell option for the data business cannot discriminate for providing the services to that consumer of course they can uh, give some kind of a financial benefit to consumers who select the sale option or who do not select that do not sell option but from service provision perspective there is no not discrimination uh, should be there clearly in the uh, service provided by the organization then the next interesting stuff is opt in for minors as per ccpa the minors are considered as a 16 years of age and uh, there has to be a mandatory consent uh, for uh, and and that's affirmative consent for processing the data and ccpa also has interestingly included one more category there so if that particular uh, child is between 13 to 16 years of age then there has to be affirmative consent from that child and if it's below 13 years then the affirmative consent from their parent or guardians has to be obtained so for for the organization perspective they have to look at what age group the minor fails in and accordingly they have to provide those options the next part is uh, typically the data subject or data principle rights which we talk about if a consumer wants to look at whether the information is collected by the organization is accurate they want to have access to that information then it is the obligation for the business house to provide those requisite access for the consumer to really look at uh, the data and probably the next level is ask for the correct correction of that data the next obligation we talk about deleting the personal information which rini also mentioned earlier once the purpose for which it is collected is over that particular uh, project is completed then the organization must delete that personal information because they have collected is only for that particular purpose unless there is a different act for which they have to keep that information and they have to clearly justify why they are keeping that information which is which uh, data or which law really on mandates them to put that information can we also discuss about non discrimination when we talk about provide do not sell information and uh, the last but not the least that is common <laughs> practically across all privacy laws or security laws we say reasonable security practices the business has to ensure that all those practices has been implemented towards securing the data typically we talk about uh, confidentiality integrity availability access control and so on and so forth including how the data breach management is handled as part of the security practices so as i said these are the obligations either towards the consumer or towards the law so in in a nutshell i try to just um, uh, collate this so if there are any pointers we want to discuss or if i have missed something as i said it's more of a theoretical uh, explanation we can definitely look at in our uh, discussion uh, time thank you thank you very thank you much uh, thanks thanks anil sir thank you very much and uh, uh, i think uh, the context being set if i am right uh, for all of us so we were trying to look at as i said data controllers from three different laws and we are all very familiar with the gdpr uh, since um, the data controller from other two law perspective has been already covered i am sure that this would be uh, quite easy for us 
because we'll see most places uh, similarities arising. I thought first, before I move on, there are lots of uh, roles with respect to GDPR, but today's context is from the, um, what you call um, controller perspective, the same definition, what he covered, right? Controller is a person who is going to determine the needs, number one. And number two, how he is going to process the personal data of the data subject, means, approach, strategy, simple, that's all. So anybody, the legal entity or a person who is going to determine the need of the data subject, he is coming under the bracket of controller, that's all. So I, I'm not going to touch about other roles. Quite interestingly, to give more, what's a controller? It could be an entity, as we said, or it could be a single person, natural person again, who is dealing with the personal data of consumers, employees, employees organization I'm referring to here. Only collect the data, what they need to fulfill for the defined purpose purpose limitation comes into picture. So he is not going to collect anything more than what is required to service him or her. They are not allowed to collect any data which falls outside the scope. Another, we need to understand joint controller. In some cases, there could be more than one controller who does, let's say, some activity A, another controller does activity B. So, you know, finally, they need to definitely help the data subject to designate a single point contact amongst these two who is going to be the person. Yeah, basically like a consortium type. We give lots of examples during our training. So here, the data subject need to be very clear in case if I'm going to have a kind of question, kind of service I need, whom I should contact, A controller or a B controller, joint controller. That's So the privacy notice, the transparency topic, et cetera, need to be very clear that for this reason, you contact me. That's all here we are talking about. Having said this controller to understand the topic of today's discussion as we are discussing, what is the role of a data controller, the expectation of the GDPR perspective? The general obligation of a data controller to adapt simple double quote, technical and organizational measures. I can even add here, even though it is not part of our GDPR, administrative measures, right? We all understand technical measures like a typical one example, you know, handling our network security, operational security, firewall, whatnot organizational measures in terms of uh, you know the, the support functions right my policies procedures roles and responsibilities governance risk and controls etc so even if you talk about hipaa the same thing would be available there so there is a kind of similarity so the first obligation he should ensure that he is going to set up this technical and organizational measures and quite interestingly he should be able to demonstrate in case of any kind of situation, a data breach occurs, right? This is where he is going to tell the supervisor authority that look at, I have this, this, this system, etc. As long as you have a system, probably you will also be not fined. We used to say, you know, losing a laptop is not something uh, great, that's okay. But have you encrypted the data, encrypted that laptop? If I've done so, if I'm able to give that evidences to my supervisor authority, you are safe. That's what we are talking about here. The second is, Operating a regular audit program plus the other measures like data protection impact assessment we are going to discuss, it is his responsibility, right? Uh, now, going forward, the main thing I'm trying to put it and on the you know uh, top side, you can see here, the article uh, 24 talks about uh, accountability, the responsibility of the data controller. And we also know what is the meaning of recitals is nothing but an implementation guidelines. To, to implement this particular article, which is available from 74 to 77. You look at the um, GDPR you know, uh, PDF, then you will be able to. So coming back here. So the first one, obviously here, even in India, we are talking about the privacy by design, right? Privacy by default. So that is one obligation. Two, in some cases, the data controller have to perform the data protection impact assessments, obviously. In India also, we talked about it. Number three, in some cases, again, in some cases, criteria defined, we, they need to have appoint a data protection officer, DPO. And 
if the organization is not established in the European Union, they need to have their representative need to be registered at the supervised authority of that particular region, what we call EU representative. Number five, they need to have, you know, if they are going to have processor, what kind of uh, control they have, what kind of contract they have, what kind of written agreement they have, all these things, it's the responsibility of data controller. And obviously the GDPR itself clearly specifies the uh, requirement in terms of maintaining the records on in certain cases of your processing activities. Quickly to cover, when we talk about privacy by design or privacy by default PDPB, we all know what we are trying to do, what uh, Srini said, right? The same thing here I am talking about, implementing the technical measures to ensure the basic rule of information security. Everything is generally forbidden unless expressly permitted. That's where we have, you know, kind of uh, um, request by the business and then approval process in place and then maintaining it. Rather than the weaker rule, what is that weaker rule? Allow anybody and everybody inside the system. Everything is generally permitted unless expressly forbidden, ulta. So we need to be careful that need to have a proper access control. So you need to establish need to know principle and the principle of least privilege by default. That's the concept of, right? When we talk about privacy by design, there are seven steps. Simply says, you know, be proactive and don't go for reactive. Obviously it's going to kill us. And only when there is a problem, I'm going to look into it. It's not a valid way. User privacy must be the default setting, right? So you need to ensure, keep that in your mind. Need to know principle, need to access principle, need to delete principle, blah, blah, blah. Each law is going to talk about the, uh, the ex what you call the rules, rights of the data subject. So you need to implement that. That need to be consent for data sharing should not be assumed. Ensure. This is quite interesting. This is where I always say in all our uh, discussions, Look at your data protection compliance standard of India, you know, by Navi, FDPPI. Wow. All these things are built in there, the 50 implementation specifications, right? So don't assume you need to have an explicit consent is the key. Privacy need to be embedded into the design at the beginning. Again, I'm not able to stop myself in, you know, relating to DPSI, uh, the data protection standard compliance of India. We say that. Uh, at the business level, at the organization level, we need to think about it. That's what I'm talking about here. PDPB sees an achievable balance between the privacy and security because it's going to cost me. I do not have right to you know, uh, unplug it. No way. You have to provide it. So you need to uh, create a balance. And end to end, you, know, you need to think about implementing these steps. And obviously it needs to be documented because the first bullet, what we said, you need to provide the evidence in case if there is a breach and it must be user-centric user as we talked about earlier, you know, keeping him or her in mind. We talked about reasonable security practices. If you if you have really, you know, got in what both Anil and Srini talked about, right? reasonable security practices, RSP, even our Information Technology Act 2000, 2008, amended, HIPAA, everybody talks about it. Same thing here, security of processing, we are talking about Article 32 clearly identifies. In what we are trying to do in information security, we are trying to protect all the information and we are trying to look at the risk from the CIA part, confidentiality, integrity and availability. When we talk about IT security, what we're trying to do, we are trying to protect the hardware, software. What we are trying to, what is the risk over there? We are looking at it, loss of data abuse by unauthorized person, confidentiality breach and so on. Personal data protection, what I'm trying to do here, right? Article 32 of your GDPR beautifully addresses security of processing. Here we are talking about protection of natural persons, right? Natural persons and their rights, privacy, that's all. Here, the focus is, the risk is violation of any constitutional rights. It's a breach. So to summarize, we all know, Personal data protection is about more than just implementing the information security. Obviously, we all know to implement privacy, I need to have information security as my base. Fair enough. But 
that is not privacy. That's what we are trying to say. Techno legal compliance need to be. Now, when we say reasonable security practices, what we are talking about, have an excellent access control, try to implement pseudonymization, right? Many of the laws talks about, right? Anonymization, pseudonymization, de-identified techniques, implement encryption, and make sure that disk encryption or cloud solution with encryption, data encryption, et cetera, we need to have. Transmission control have a high uh, TLS kind of protocols, what we talk about it, so that when the data is in transient, there is no going to be a kind of surprise. Confidentiality, integrity, a basic principle of information security. Recoverability in terms of having a separate backup availability perspective and evaluating at regular intervals to ensure that these measures, what I'm trying to implement is really helping me back and the organization because, because we are talking about 4%, right? Every time. This is the basic mantra for DPSCA. Also, we need to keep that in mind. Customer, um, you know, your brand image is the question. So think about it. The second, data protection impact assessment is one of the key mandatory stuff expected from the data controller article. 35 talks about lots of recital. In a nutshell, what is DPIA, data protection impact assessment, also known as the privacy impact assessment, PIA? We, we are trying to identify, analyze any risk for individuals, harm, you know, in, in Indian perspective. So if you see here, there is a beautiful correlation. There is a beautiful similarity amongst the laws. Obviously, it has to be. It cannot be something different. What could be different? That unique proposition, what each law offers, for example, consent manager, what Srini talked about in India, right? So DPIA is an instrument to identify the risk for any individuals. And quite interesting, a single assessment, you can run it across the organization to ensure that you are capturing as many defects as risks as possible. Here, uh, here GDPR beautifully uh, mentioning about when you will perform the DPIA. Certain criteria have been given quickly when we are trying to use a kind of you know, automated algorithm, decision-making, profiling, obviously think about DPIA using when you are trying to implement a new technology, you know, machine learning, IoT, medical IoT, whatnot, et cetera. Systematically monitoring a large scale of public data, like for example, CCTV, or if you are processing a children's data, obviously this could be the candidate, right? Finally, the last bullet is quite interesting. Whatever the processing is going to result in a high risk, think about a DPIA is what? GDPR. Obviously we can take the kind of best practices from here, even if you are implementing the other laws, right? High risks definition I'm trying to put here, you know, a systematic and extensive processing, including profiling, then we need to think about it. The supervised authority shall establish and make a public a list of the kind of processing operations, like what we are looking at the code of ethics, which is going to be given by our data protection authority of India. So like lots of, you know, ICO information commissioner's office and the each supervised authority's offices gives us some kind of best practices, the criteria we need to look at it. And DPIA in simple, it should include, what are we trying to do? Why, what is the need for a DPIA? Who are all the different stakeholders? What we are trying to address, et cetera. Don't worry. Even if you log into the ICO website, it's, a pub, it's in the public domain. You will get a good template to understand what DPIA should capture. So to summarize, identify the need for your DPIA, right? What is the purpose and et cetera. Describe the nature of your processing, what you're collecting, where you are going to store, how you are going to you know, provide the data subject access rights in terms of deletion, keeping it adequate, et cetera. So those kind of things will give us the kind of risk. That's why we are trying to put as much as possible. Uh, consultation process, subject matter experts sometimes, your data protection officer in the organization, or you know external consultants could we bring in as many people into the system to really understand where we may go wrong. Describe the compliance and proportionality of the measures in particular. What's your lawful basis for processing? Because GDPR talks about the six ways if you are not going to be in any one of the six and if you are doing something else, it's going to be a breach. So please be aware, identify and assess the risks. I'm talking about the privacy risks and harm to an individual or a data subject. Identify mitigation measures, obviously, as part of you know, risk mitigation and get a kind of you know, commitment from all the stakeholders is what is being proposed by GDPR. 
Moving on to DPO, Data Protection Officer, what GDPR talks about, and mandatory obligation of the data controller. That's what our topic here. There are three cases where you need to have a DPO. If you are not falling in any one of the three, forget about it. Don't worry. You don't have to, right? So if you are a public authority handling, you know, a processing of the personal data of, you know, except for courts or independent judicial authorities, then no problem. Otherwise, you need to have a DPO. Large scale regular monitoring of the data, systematic uh, data, for example, you know, uh, your online behavior tracking. If you are getting into that kind of processing work, obviously you need to have a DPO. Large scale special data category, sensitive data, what we call in our in our health related data, you know, sexual related data, right? <laughs> There is a different category of data called as special data categories from GDPR. So you need to have, for example, if you are trying to say that, hey, I am not going to have a DPO, please, please make sure that it is documented and the rationale for not having, you need to have a proper justification. It will be, it is expected anyway. Yeah. And uh, from GDPR perspective, just to give you again, as we all know, he's a single point contact. But this is quite interesting, right? DPOs are not personally responsible. Who is responsible then? Obviously, the management is responsible. So GDPR makes it clear that the controller or processor who is required to ensure and able to demonstrate that the processing is performed in accordance with the provisions of Article 24. DPOs are acting as an intermediaries between different stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, I'm talking about all this guy starting with your controller, your processor, persons in charge of, you know, processing operations, your IT probably, data subject, he's the single point contact. If you are having a, you know, third parties for any of your organization needs, he is going to be the single point contact. He is going to license with the supervised authority or regulatory authority. Any new privacy legislation comes into, he is the one who is going to spearhead within the organization, who is the single point contact of all the business units within the organization. Quite interesting. There are lots of qualifications also prescribed. We make, you can have a look at it. Then as I talked about GDPR representative from the EU perspective, if it's not established within the EU, then obviously you need to have a designated person who will be responsible. Again, what we talked about in the you know, licensing with the supervised authority, taking care of the data subject, um, um, data subjects rights and so on is the responsibility of the GD uh, representative, EU representative. A EU GDPR representative need not be appointed by a public authority or an organization which is carries out very, very occasional. For example, one particular, you know, um, survey you are conducting it probably, but all these things need to be documented, rational need to be made available in case anything probably tomorrow comes in. And what is that uh, definition of public body is also given by our European Data Protection Board, the guidance are available. If you are using a data processor as a service provider, the uh, responsibility of the data controller to have a written agreement, written agreement, and it clearly is going to say that what he is going to do or she is going to do, how he is going to do, she is going to do, etc. Right? It's 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 a beautiful um, written document, I would say. That's the expectation. And uh, Article 28 and 29 talks about, and contracts must be implemented with the service provider. They need to be without contract. You are not to going to have. In case if the processor what you have identified is going to let out certain activities to another processor, what we call sub-processor, obviously controller need to approve the same. He cannot or she cannot do without the um, knowledge of our data controller is what our GDPR talks about. Record of processing activities, GDPR simply says very clearly, data controller where applicable or the uh, EU representative shall maintain record of processing activities under their responsibility. They are they are expected, you know, obliged to maintain all the processing uh, records in case of any issue tomorrow. And data processes also required to maintain such a record about the personal data where the controllers engage, which will be anyway part of the contract what we talked about. There are some exemptions as we know. If you are having less than, you know, your organization is employing fewer than 250 person, unless if your processing is like is likely to result in a high risk and so on. Okay, with this, as I said that uh, our idea is to take only one portion 
of you know a topic called data controller and try to discuss with all of you so that you know we can um, like this for each and every uh, what you call topic we may go ahead now i would suggest that we shall go ahead in uh, discussing any open issues etc or as i said that if any of you have you know if you have missed out something please add so go ahead yeah any question anything navi sir any input from you to start with uh ramesh sir sir and here we have questions from people and then try to answer yeah sure sure sir okay. go ahead yeah and, sir uh, i think anil anil chiptungar sir on ccp there is something on uh, data by uh, revenue by selling personal data exceeds 50% If a company has advertising revenue, for example, platforms, right? They collect a lot of data, personal data, and they report eighty percent revenues from advertising. Does that actually constitute uh, revenue by selling personal data? As I said, I have more uh, looked at the Attorney General's uh, yes. explanation of this. Uh, so, if uh, in my understanding, if that uh, revenue is used using a personal data. it could be a kind of targeted selling using the personal data probably that could fall under this but if it's a general advertising without use of any personal data per se without profiling the customers without really processing their data it may not fall under that Absolutely. but then it will be i mean targeted is yeah i mean targeted is for example if a platform is collecting demographic data and you know likes and all that stuff and based on uh, all of that it is trying to create some profile and targeting ads then uh, Uh, facebook a classic example right right uh, right so that would be that would be amounting to selling of personal data right right okay. Uh, so, right, sir, I would go with what Mr. Anil said. That's exactly the explanation, right? Now, if you are the data, what you are collecting from your data subjects, their personal data. If the organization is selling that personal data and the revenue is fifty percent of it, yes, it is coming in. Ah, uh, actually, I would argue that uh, we're not selling that personal data as such, but then you are using that profile and everything to, and you are. Uh, Uh, project into the world that uh, you got such a huge user base and and based on that huge user base you are attracting revenues maybe uh, no, no, any, any ruling or anything here if you could no, share no uh, no no it is not there whatever uh, i know even that time when i read it okay now with the amendment what we call cpra, CPRA something yeah. yeah cpra something has been changed i am not aware but uh, yeah. it's very clear that no because if you are not selling the data here right you are just projecting the data as in your example what you said mm. to collect more you know into Correct. but you are not selling the data for example exactly it, yeah, yeah. then that's okay then it's not coming under the purview with the kind of mm. definition what that uh, office of attorney general had provided to us yeah uh, okay okay mm -hmm. yeah now uh, yeah, one uh, continuing same question how do someone can really validate that yes the 50% of the revenue is from uh, selling of the pi personal information how do they in the books of accounts or account receivables how do they show up in the the <laughs> i mean they may they may not show it right it's not from 50% from the advertisement personal data selling so how do they show really into the considering this kind of uh, revenues I think I think Navi sir will be the right person to address ah, this. That's what, that's what I'm asking Navi sir. No, no, that will have to be audited. Ah. If the organization doesn't do the audit, the attorney general can order the audit. If there is a doubt about if it is a borderline case, the, ah. perhaps he will ask for a declaration uh, to start with. And uh, most of the time, the declaration may be accepted uh, on its face value. But if there is a doubt, uh, he will uh, ask for uh, yeah. Not it, and if it is proved that it was a misrepresentation, there could be even cheating, uh, kind of a, um, in a serious offence. Yeah, uh, and Navi sir, Navi sir, as we know, how do they take it into the book of book of accounts? That itself is a question. I, that's what my thinking is. I agree. Yeah. Auditor will have to find out the means of segregating the, the revenue uh, by sale. See, we are talking of sale only, no? So. what happens is in a sale you have to actually have a contractual relationship with the buyer and that will exactly show what is the data which is made available or you can call it as disclosure or whatever is that but it is given for a consideration 
and i think that will be captured in the business contracts so now is that original question like if i'm getting advertising revenue and if it is known that the basis for my getting advertising revenue is my storage and collection of personal data of a huge user base can that be deemed to be a revenue earned from sale no, no, of when you say advertising revenue where does yeah. it come from let us say i am having a website or yeah. some service and say if people um, i have got so many people who are subscribing to this or visiting this website Right. and if you advertise here you will get that much of exposure correct so that correct. is not uh, amounting to sale of uh, uh, the personal data yes correct okay okay, okay. so there it, uh, it you don't need any other contract or something like that it is only marketing this thing you may say i have got uh, 1 million views on my website okay right. uh, so if you advertise on my website uh, you will get that benefit but okay. it is not a sale of the personal data correct. of the visitors to the advertiser okay but if uh, uh, i am doing targeted advertising uh, then it so if you have got a contract in which uh, you do some profiling and give a yeah. set of data of yeah. a particular gender age location etc to another person right, so that right. he can do his own marketing then you are actually yeah. selling the data right? uh, that's right. that is Correct. captured in the contracts Okay, okay. So if I look at the balance sheet of the company and look at mm. their revenue side, who mm. has actually given money? If I see the credit side of the bank account, then perhaps I will be able to get what who are the persons who are making the payment of that nature. So that is something which an auditor has to do, uh, okay. and uh, the attorney general will initially ask for declaration. You declare mm. whether you have got more than fifty percent or not. If you declare wrongly, it is like. Giving a wrong declaration to a law enforcement authority and U.S. law is quite strict, strict. more yeah. than Indian law. Mm. Okay. They may go behind bars for a hundred years. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They can run case and other things. Misrepresentation of financial data is a very serious uh, offense. Uh, offense yeah. There. That's right. Yeah. Rajesh ji, you still have some extension to the question. Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, um, uh, two things I want to know. One is that uh, what is the difference between the CCPA and uh, CPRA? And uh, second thing, uh, you know, uh, in uh, CCPA, we you said uh, you know in the slide that uh, it provide opt-in for minor. So the same thing. What uh, generally we said the tick mark uh, things that you know somebody declares that he is the minor and then uh, you know any any. But I'm just trying to see what is your experience on that. These two things. If you can as, as I said, it's more of a theoretical, but uh, I have not really come across the implementation of CCAPA per se. So I may not be able to give you the more uh, detail of how exactly it is implemented uh, in an organization. So, so, so to, to to Anil sir to answer his yeah. first question, Rajesh, yeah. CCPA California Consumer Privacy Act is the initial version. Okay. The next updated version was called as CPRA California Privacy Rights right, Act. Sir. which is going to come from 2023 okay. right now here we are talking about the children's age less than 16 like gdpr so you need to have the guardians um, acknowledgement they need to prove that right otherwise they cannot um, allow them that's all now how they are going to do like the same question what nagendra had asked obviously they need to have a system right where how we are going to validate Yes, that person yes. at the time of uh, registering themselves with the website of that organization right what are all the documents you are going to ask whether it is ssn or etc god only knows right so these are all obviously going to be implemented right if if they are not going to check that and then allowed them then obviously it is a breach and that organization is going to face fund right correct uh, i i, add, I, I hope uh, you remember that there was a big case in us uh, sorry uk Uh, wherein the son right had uh, used a credit card left and right and then it had gone to the court and uh, father was fine and father said i am not responsible at all you are not considered me you are not taken any concern from me at the time of issuing issuing a card to my son so they couldn't to proceed so it is the responsibility of the data controller to ensure that the person is so and so age is so and so validate it verify it allow him to be part of your system and otherwise it's going to be considered as a breach yes vini please go ahead sorry 
<laughs> just for rajesh question rajesh even when we are going for this baiju app and all <clears throat> they are they are asking for the parental consent right like and uh, for example in offices we have this crutch facilities right where children are being admitted even in that cases the parental consent or guardian consent is mandated you have to get a consent from the parent that no your ch- your child will be admitted within the uh, crutch facilities like that no no sini i agree with you see on the physical ground yes uh, because uh, you know uh, that is possible but i was trying to see in the in the digital way how one can give the consent from the parents unless and until uh, you know uh you know as you correctly said you know everyone that you know there should be a validation methods and second thing you know children also now you know us or you know those those places now now it is not like a uh, internet is new for them so maybe 7 8 years onwards you know they can go to you know whichever sites and all the stuff then you know there should be a provision over there yes yes yeah you may understand it should be like a kind of a tick box or electronic consent yeah yeah okay yeah thank you uh ramesh dimesh here ha ah, bimesh um, um i heard you saying about dpi hai so you know there some people say pi hai uh, is there any you know, can we distinguish between these two there are like you know assessments only right when you say data protection assessment yeah. or, you know risk assessment you know, when it comes to processing the data and uh, if there is any difference and if there is no difference and i just wanted to know as you know uh, a little bit like you know, if you can throw more light on that Uh, even at uh, my slide is said if i am right that uh, data protection impact assessment or privacy impact assessment because it's just a kind of nomenclature in my understanding um uh, organization calls it right uh, we we call here data protection impact assessment straight from the gdpr terminology i had seen some organizations when i was a consultant they used to call privacy impact assessment or Uh, data impact assessment etc i but the concept remains the same if i am right we are looking at what is the impact here in indian law is so specific right harm to the data subject and harm includes the criteria is available so here we are looking at privacy risk of the data subject what is the risk of the patient in terms of their data how are you going to handle am i right navi sir so i don't to see any big uh, uh, what you call definition change uh, except the except the heading per se <laughs> yeah bimesh oh, no. i i i had seen <laughs> trust me i had seen lots of uh, blogs or materials even at the time of my sessions on gdpr uh, no mm-hmm. no way it's, Because, it's um, like say uh, i think i'm losing you so so bimesh just to add uh, shini here uh, <clears throat> what what whatever ramesh told is uh, is perfect like for example any inventory inventory is asset right any inventory or application or tool which collects or processes or stores personal data within an organization it has to be recorded in a central repository and it has to be done by the data fiduciary or the business owner or a process owner of the application along with the it application manager and it has to be reviewed and approved by the data protection officer like ramesh was mentioning the slide what is the type of data what is the uh, description of the processing what are the categories of the data which is being stored any sensitive data is being involved where is the data being stored is the data center location within the country or outside the country any third party sub uh, service providers are involved okay if is there any upstream or downstream flow of personal data to any other application within the organization that has to be recorded there okay <clears throat> and how the deletion factors you no know, has that you no know, as the tool or application has uh, pro- properly you know deletion retention parameters being factored uh, technical and administration safeguards which ramesh was discussing whether these are factored within that application and tool all that has to be recorded in a single place and it has to be uploaded that, that actually you know if you see look at the data inventory or record of uh, authority yeah, right? bo- both are that synonymously provide... used name uh, both are uh, same yeah, so privacy but, impact assessment when we or... do this dpia or pia right you know mm-hmm. Oh, uh, man! What triggers is it when there is a risk involved, or minimum data protection, and you know, minimum uh, proportionality and minimization we talk about. That's where I think, and am I supposed to process the data? That's where these two triggers. And just my, um, you know, uh, my intention to ask this question is: Should I? They can be interchangeably used, or are they meant for a little bit different, uh, you know, intention? And if ninety percent is, they might be mapping. 
and is the need 10 or 5% is different in these two if you draw a Venn diagram pia and you know dpi there might be slight you know overlapping but or maybe 5 10% is i mean a lot overlapping maybe little bit difference that's what i somehow thought so i wanted to clarify that with you guys so no no in my in my view it is used synonymously both are same so it will, it should also have a the, the data protection officer should give a rating moderate minor medium catastrophic like you know whether what will be the impact if the data is getting compromised so that also should be part of that uh, data protection impact assessment or privacy impact assessment yeah no i i can add one more uh, angle to it if you are talking of privacy protection through data protection then the two are same but suppose you are talking of data protection for information security then perhaps what we may say is data protection of non personal data impact assessment is different from exactly sir mm-hmm. sir navi yeah. sir navi yeah. sir only correction there in information security i'm sure lots of people here they will agree with me there is no question of impact assessment it's simply a risk assessment with respect to cia part no, at least when you when you have a data breach ah, when, yes, sir. when you have a discussion with ah, ah, ah. regulator you yeah. will have to make an assessment yes, sir. Yes, sir. you have to okay. argue that there is no uh, damage uh, no, no, no. I, 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 suppose it is encrypted so you are going to say it is an encrypted data so it is uh, there is no problem something like that okay Yeah. In a way, risk assessment is also sort of the you now impact assessment. Impact assessment. That's all. That's all. That's all. <laughs> yeah. That the only only I see from because uh, their CIA with respect to security mm-hmm. here privacy with respect to the right. data subjects focus. Right. Right. That's yeah. All. Yeah. Right. Here the harm has to be on the uh, data subjects. Correct. Correct. Whereas there the harm is more to the company side. Yeah. Yeah. But that is an indirectly. there also you have to consider the harm with the data owner but suppose let us say marketing data is lost right okay. now marketing data or say a research proposal or your, something like that is lost then yeah. there is more loss to the organization right. than to an individual uh, data subject so a data pro- protection impact assessment from non privacy related issues could be slightly different from the privacy issue yes, correct that's uh, that's issues. Right. when you deal with the projects or new uh, business case comes in, in you know uh, not exactly related to that you know data subject that time i think we can go for pia that's what you were saying right sir no, no no when you have personal data you go for pia is a better right. t- terminology to use when you mm-hmm. are likely to have business data then perhaps uh, the use of a terminology like dpia is uh, fine but if you are looking at the gdpr or indian law they are using the dpia within the privacy act itself mm. so here mm. when you use dpia you are meaning uh, only privacy impact assessment Correct. where you mm. take the data principle right. or the subject calculate mm. what kind of harm will be there significance of the harm will have to be evaluated probability of occurrence will have to be evaluated mm. all that from the perspective of the data subject okay mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Uh, in fact uh, the other loss to the, um, uh, the company is only secondary that is it's only a reflected uh, effect of the harm caused if more harm is caused you are likely to have more penalty if, okay. if less harm is caused perhaps penalty will be less so ultimately there is a liability to the company but the assessment will have to be through the data principles harm Mm. and then you come to what class or what impact is there for the company that is in the privacy as uh, impact as okay. factor on the sort of right and uh, another question to all of you guys like uh, i heard recently ico has come up with some proposals and they are just in proposal for the public consultation but anyway they they said they are going to go ahead with this some of the changes they made in their uh, dpa 2018 and one of them is uh, removal of data protection officer role in their uh, act and how are they going to fill that gap i mean are they going to i mean this is the curiosity like um, i wanted to know if you guys heard this story or this just you know june i think 2022 they came up with this proposal and uh, many people suggested don't remove it, but they said anyway they are going to go ahead with that it's their way or highway kind of thing is there and they are going to go ahead 
and how are they going to fill that gap who is going to play that role of dpo now where where exactly it's ico sir ico ico information commissioner office it will be UK. Or, uh, within uk in, uk within, within UK. Uh, the information commissioner's office Uh -huh. that's, uh, I see. So that is actually so, so, it was in the news. I just thought you guys are aware. So of so Bimesh, so you you are trying to say, if I'm right, it is with respect to UK GDPR, maybe. Right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. 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 How hmm. can they make an assessment of their own data protection uh, requirement? Maybe that is one of the uh, things. Another, uh, another sir, ICO is really acting weird. One recent case, I forgot the case. Solicitor was fined ninety thousand euros. I mean, sorry, uh, pounds, almost one crore rupees. Ah. And then the another client, I think, they took the you know so, um, advice from them. And their case is like you know there is a data incident. Nobody reports till uh, on a legal. Ex outside or inside councils, they decide it. Kuta mm. language is a legal expert. Mm. If there is a data breach, and there is a option like you know, if it is not going to hurt, harm, risk, poses any risk to the data subjects or anybody, you don't have to report. You just make a note and keep that in the report. But now they came up exactly opposite. Who are you to decide it's not going to harm the data subject? And this case, I'll ping it once. I mean, I can ping it and I think I forgot the name of that. Hmm. Some weird case, and it's like you know, uh, it's like a playing with the Russian roulette. If you don't report everything to them, I mean, in this case, like we're like stuck between like yeah. you know deep. Uh, that that and, you know, risk, which, that risk has to be absorbed by the company by having an internal mm -hmm. mechanism whereby mm -hmm. an internal data audit committee will recommend whether we should report or we should not report something like But that. But sir, sir, they're saying who are you to decide that? Tell us who will no. decide. <laughs> if if I if no, that is a, true. That is a legal issue. If I say there mm -hmm. is no, no harm, and if the supervisory authority says there is harm, we will go to the court and. Uh, Okay, but it's but sir, basically they're trying to put a pressure no, on correct. the companies. Correct. Understand. Company. Understand. You come and tell us everything. Yeah. We will pick. We will take a pick whether to go ahead with that or not. And all these uh, EU yeah. supervisory authorities, they are individuals like uh, one executive. EU is okay, sir. I am talking about ICO. EU has not done this job. Uh, I, okay. I mean, they are weird. Sometimes uh, Australia will come. Yeah, up EU also them. has fined the Parliament of EU itself. <laughs> they are fined. <laughs> so that that is also strange in my view. You sir, you anyway, it's going to be a... ask the parliament to do a better job, but still, <clears throat> an uh, executive trying to find uh, the parliament, uh, it is only show of strength. I uh, I feel it is not. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm not very happy with that kind of a system. Mm, okay. uh, the parliament itself is fine. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, last question. I've been pondering. Everybody, like you know, uh, when we say data subject, it's a natural person. Just maybe it's for the. It's not a pun intended, but sometimes I would like to know why they did not include a person who is dead, like you know, natural person. Is it because these legislators were scared, or I mean, that no, 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 no. It is if you look at Singapore, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you look up Singapore, Bimesh, that mm -hmm. uh, law is addressing uh, deceased persons. Okay. No, 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 I, have, I, have, I have another argument. Sorry. Okay. I have another argument. that is all these data protection laws are meant to protect the right to privacy which is a fundamental citizen's right now a person who is dead is not no longer a citizen okay so this law cannot protect his defamation or other uh, kind of rights which his uh, as a descendants need to protect so they will they are entitled to protection from a different law not from this law that's all i would like to say and in the case of singapore as well as in hipa what they have done is the security aspects related to the data that obligation will get extended by a certain time 10 years uh, here and maybe in hipa up to 50 years but still it is not the privacy protection of the deceased individual it is the protection of the data uh for a certain period right. because there is no logic in protecting the right 
which is called a fundamental constitutional right to privacy. Right to privacy is a state of mind of a person who is giving his choice by way of a consent. Now he is dead. So where can he give a consent? Where can, where can he give a withdrawal of the consent? Where can he give a change of consent? Because that option is not there, it is not exercisable. Privacy right is not exercisable by a deceased person, according to my uh, view of combining the law, legal issue with this. Okay. Navi huh? sir, oh, Navi sir, only thing is that you said HIPAA, for example, right? Hmm. There, there is no question of privacy after the person passed away when he or she is no more, right? But what we understand that since it's a sensitive data, health related, for example, Jailalita, even today, they don't want to publish, right? So it may be for 10 years at least. So what is that right? That right need not be called the privacy right. That's what ah, I'm saying. Okay, okay. I okay. understand. For example, if it leads to loss of property or something like that by disclosure, then you want to protect it, fine. If it leads to defamation, then protect it by defamation right. So I'm saying whatever you are uh, having concern, that can be protected, but it need not be protected as a right to privacy. Mm. which is defined as, say, in India, Article right. 21 or something like that. Mm. Right, got it, got it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah.